the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckroth, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hi, this is Tracy Stuckrath with Thrive Meetings and Events and the podcast Eating at a Meeting. In today's session, we have got my friend Erin, who lives up in Alexandria. She is the executive director of Allergy Strong, the CEO of Allergy Health, and the founder of the blog Allergy Smallergy. She is quite busy around food allergies. So help me welcome Erin Malware. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you. This is so much fun. You're welcome. I am so excited to have you as um, one of my first guests on this. So this is exciting. You're very busy around food allergies, CEO, executive director, blogger. So tell me what got you into this whole allergy world. Yeah, well, it was it was kind of simple. I, I did not grow up with food allergies. I didn't live with them myself. Uh, my husband's family had some, and he himself has some sensitivities around food. But it seemed, you know, a kind of a distant thing that they didn't really talk about it. They didn't really deal with it. It wasn't really mentioned, only on occasion. Um, and my son, when he was born, had a lot of what I now see were the warning signs of food allergies. He was covered in eczema from a very early age. He experienced severe bouts of asthma starting when he was about eight months old, which was really scary. And um, the pediatrician had warned us that it was possible he might have food allergies and that we should avoid a number of things. Um, And the list was very, very long. And I thought it was honestly so crazy and unnecessary to be totally honest. I was very kind of a doubter at the time because I never, you know, like many of us, we didn't grow up with this being so prevalent. We didn't see it. We never saw it in action. And nonetheless, the precursors. And and then at around 15 or 16 months old, he had a second bout of asthma that was very severe and we tested him for food allergies. And he was allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, sesame seeds, dairy, eggs, soy, wheat, and corn. Oh, what do you feed him? Great. So that's exactly what went through my head. After I got off the phone and my head was spinning and the only advice I got at that time was, uh, I'm sending you a prescription for epinephrine not how to use it, not when to use it, but just that you have it and go see an allergist. Those were the only two bits of information I got. And um, I took a walk to try to clear my head and figure out what to do. And then I realized I had to feed him dinner in an hour. And, you know, right. What do you do? Yeah. What do you do? And now I felt like I didn't trust anything. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't trust my own knowledge. I didn't trust what was in the food. I didn't know enough. And I at least knew that I didn't know enough. Um, and I look back now thinking, wow. I really knew nothing. <laughs> now that I know more, I really knew nothing. Right. Um, and, and I will say that, you know, at the time I walked with my husband who's very practical minded and I was grieving kind of the loss of what I saw as childhood rites of passage, you know, mm-hmm. going to the ice cream parlor after a soccer game or, you know, having a pizza night or, and these were all things that um, he would be allergic to and wouldn't be able to participate in. Uh, and then I kind of, my head was spinning and I was worried about his, his de- psychological development. I didn't want him to feel different or ostracized. Uh, I wanted him to feel like included and supported. And, mm-hmm. um, and my husband said to me, you know, there's gotta be a way around all of this. Let's, let's look for the simple answer. We'll figure it out as we go along. There'll be a way around all of this. And so we started the blog allergy Schmallergy. Um, and I did that with the intent of, I I looked online for some resources. There weren't very many at the time. This is about 15 years ago. Um, they weren't easy to find or easy to navigate. And so I figured if I was going to do research to keep my son safe, well, then there'd be another family that had one or all of those same allergies that could benefit from that, those hours of research. Um, so the blog, uh, I had the blog, uh, for years and years. It's a little more than 10 years old now. And, um, we kind of went from there. Some opportunities arose and and the more you learn about food allergies, the more you see that there may have been gaps in, um, in coverage or in education. Um, and you get involved that way. So I have been involved in advocacy. Um, we were featured on the discovery channel 
in 2013 in a documentary called um, Emerging Epidemic. Um, and um, I started a organization called Allergy Strong, which helps support underserved communities with food allergies, which was mm-hmm. a, a major gap and remains a major gap today. Right. Uh, and then I started a company just to c- continue that, that um, spread of awareness and education um, called Allergy Health. And we um, bring content directly from experts to patients um, surrounding a whole host of topics um, on food allergies, a 360 degree view of food allergies. So medical, lifestyle, um, psychosocial topics, yeah. et cetera. So we, we try to really cover the gamut. Yeah. But you just keep, uh, when there's an opportunity and if I could lend my you know, expertise for any kind of good, greater good, I try to do it. That's awesome. And there's so many different aspects of this that people don't think about. And, you know, oh my God, you have a food allergy or you can't eat that. Why, why can't you eat that? I mean, I, it blows people's minds that you, you, you could go through life without having, being able to eat something. And, um, how can I live without that? You know, it's, Right. And it's our normal, right? When we right. live with food allergies, it's our normal. And what I think I what I've noticed sort of as I um, speak to different communities and, and different audiences is that the level of understanding about what is a food allergy and what is not a food allergy is kind of lacking. And there's a lot of blurred lines that need to be um, clarified. Right. And once they are, people start understanding the behaviors and mindsets of those of us who do live with it day to day. Right. Um, so you know, that's, that's a big misconception. A lot of people think of food allergies more like a food intolerance, um, mm-hmm. and they're just really not the same thing. Right. So on that note, and, and just to preface everybody, you're not a doctor, but you're a mom of a food allergic kid for 15 years now, right? Right. So, that's right. So tell us the difference. What is an allergy and what isn't? Right. So a food allergy is immune, an immune system response um, to a food protein. So when the body senses that protein, it thinks of it as a foreign invader, like we might for um, an infection or a virus, and it begins to send out the alerts and, and start attacking it. Um, but it, it attacks it so much that it starts shutting down the body. So it can lead to mild reactions, and we can cover what those are later, what those look like, to very severe reactions called anaphylaxis that can lead to death. Um, now, when it comes to a food intolerance, that is when the body cannot digest certain enzymes, very different situations. So those symptoms tend to be more digestive in nature, um, a bad stomach, vomiting, diarrhea, other bathroom issues. Um, and that is having to do with the lack of an enzyme to help break down the food. Um, and celiac disease, which is a third food-related condition, is also different from food allergy. That is an autoimmune disease mm-hmm. um, where the body cannot tolerate gluten. Um, otherwise, it will attack the intestines and lead to long-term problems. So people with celiac disease, disease do Im- avoid foods like those of us with food allergy, but they are different conditions. Yes. And I'm going to have some people talking about celiac disease as well oh, um, on the show because it is... And the one thing about eating at a meeting is it's, it doesn't matter if your dietary need is religious-based or food allergic or celiac disease. It is a, a, something that happened or that something that needs to be taken into consideration to create inclusion. That's you know? exactly right. That's so exactly right. One of the questions that I, I want to know is what does food, as a food allergic mom, What does food allergy, or not food allergy, but what does food and beverage inclusion mean to you? Well, it means, um, well, A, the the level of understanding between all these three conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, So understand that when someone who has an allergy explains that they can't have something, that it really is a life or death situation and it needs to be taken with a level of seriousness that perhaps another condition might not, like a food preference. Um, That's a different situation. Um, it requires, um, some level of, you know, understanding, bringing some empathy to the situation and preparedness. Um, I love when I go to a meeting and, um, they've communicated in advance what the menu is so I can prepare. It's very thoughtful to me. And that to me is inclusive. It allows me to know in advance 
how I can interact uh, at a meeting or at a conference or, mm-hmm. um, or even just at a lunch uh, gives me time to prepare in the way that makes me feel the most comfortable. And so anytime that, that you can take the time to allow a participant to be the most comfortable they can be, they'll be bringing value to the event and the meeting um, that's taking place. I love that. Yeah, because it, it allows us to participate whole fully in that experience. And That's I exactly. think that goes not just, and I know the podcast is called Eating at a Meeting, but I think meeting can be re- re- replaced with birthday party or, yes. you know, soccer tournament, you know, what's at the soccer snack bar, right? Or even going to a hockey game and a major league hockey game. Absolutely. And all of these things take place both on the child level, but also as adults, we all experience these exact situ- social situations that we have to face. And whether you're a kid facing it or an adult, you still see, need this sort of the same things. You need that level of preparedness, the time to respond. You need to be able to you know, know if you can bring your own food, know if there's a person I can talk to, what the flexibility of the, the event is um, so that I can be there and be there fully. Because really the whole purpose of all of these events, no matter what they are, is the the person-to-person interaction. Right. Um, and, and that's what does get in the way. Unfortunately, food allergies do get in the way of that because of the risk of, you know, the, the risk of death, which is rare, but it, but you just, it's unpredictable. So right. it exists. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned a little while ago, the, um, and I'm good. Do you know, Emily Brown? Yes, I yes. do. Her work so, is amazing. Her work, and so she's going to be on the show in a couple of weeks too. Oh, I'm so glad um, she's fantastic. Yes. I love her. Um, but talk about the economics of food allergies. How has it impacted your family budget? Um, and, you know, what other kinds of things does it, I mean, it takes energy and it takes extra time, right? Because you have to oh, read yeah. tons of labels, but explain that to people for me. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't live with a food allergy, you may not understand how much effort and time and money goes into maintaining the lifestyle that you need to survive safely. So, um, so we'll, let's start from a time perspective. Um, the way I describe it and as a parent particularly is that not only do I have to spend time making sure and reading labels, making sure the food that I buy is safe. So I, and, and by the way, we read it multiple times because there's a lot of room for error, especially if you have a food allergen that is not as common. Um, there are eight most common food allergies and we can go over those later as well. But, um, and if you fall outside that, which we do with sesame seeds, um, that, that uh, ingredient can be hidden in other words. Like if you see the word spices or natural flavorings, um, that means that it could have sesame, which means that I have to call the manufacturer and they may or may not tell me whether sesame is in a product. Um, And that takes time. Imagine if you had to do that for 10 of the items that you bought on a regular shopping trip, which is pretty normal. Right. Um, So not only do those things take time, but then I often have to prepare uh, sort of equivalence for my son. He, you know, he's a teenager now, but um, every birthday party that we went to, the cake was never safe. It, it's never baked in a, in a safe bakery. Um, so I always say, when your child has a birthday party, I have to bake a cake. You know, mm-hmm. that's, if you think about that times the number of kids in a classroom or the number of parties your child goes to a year, um, that is what a food allergy parent is doing. And every time there's a soccer snack, I'm bringing in the snack. I'm snack mom every week, right? So, um, you know, I'm snack mom and it's like that for everything, for the movies, for our sleepovers. My son's going away with a friend this weekend. I'm packing, you know, a certain number of his meals to make sure that he has some things that are safe to eat um, and not left without an alternative. Um, and then we talk about the medication, which costs a lot of money. Epinephrine auto injectors used to cost, um, you know, the epinephrine itself is not very expensive, but it, it used to cost, you know, between ten and fifty dollars. Now the average cost is about six hundred dollars per set, and everyone needs two, um, two at a minimum sets or two. Well, pens. Two, two pens together, which is a set, mm-hmm. um, and children often need multiple sets, and adults often need multiple sets. Sometimes adults will leave a set at work and have a set for their bag or a set for home. Um, children often have a set for school and a set for home or a set with a grandparent. Um, and by the way, don't forget this is medicine you hope you never have to use. You hope that you throw it out untouched at the end of every single year and it's only good for a year. Um, and then there's a the cost of going to specialists and getting testing and, and, and it really does add up um, mm-hmm. as well as labor productivity. Um, a lot of us feel that we might not want to travel as much for work because we want to be closer to our child in case there's an emergency. 
Um, we may not take a certain job because it's not flexible for um, being available for the food allergic child, which does require more time. Um, so there's quite a lot that goes into this. Um, it, when you look at it as a um, as a nation, there's been a study out, and Ruchi Gupta after, and her group out of Northwestern conducted Talking a study in about team. 2013. Yeah. Um, and I'll let her really give you the ins and outs, but she calculated that it costs nearly $25 billion a year um, most of that 20 billion of which is shouldered by families. So this is not an industry problem. This is, this is, this food allergies are costing $20 billion a year for families. Um, uh, roughly about $4,500 per child per year. And, um, and most families, you know, really have a hard time shouldering that burden. That's a lot of money, um, mm-hmm. particularly for families that live paycheck to paycheck or meal to meal, mm-hmm. um, which is where allergy strong was born out of. Yeah. And it, it's, it's quite amazing. And, and I don't know, have you been able, cause I have heard some things that you can actually write that food off on your taxes. Has your tax accountant been able to do that for you? No, no. Um, and part of the reason is it is, um, you have to keep a track of it and that's, that's fine. You could do that, but I believe you have to hit a certain number and we just don't do that. But gotcha. yes, taxes, that is an uh, medically, when you, you have a medically necessary diet, it is worth talking to your accountant or talking to an accounting firm to talk about what the current tax code allows Mm -hmm. for that, because, um, you can write some of that off, which is great. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when a couple of months ago, you released a video called the ABCs of food allergy, right? Or the spell it out. Wasn't that? Spell it out. It was spell spell it it out. out. Yes, you did. Yes, yes, yes. 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 So I'm so glad it was you're on your it blog is the ABCs of food allergy. So yes, um, correct. No, you're right. No, you. That was yeah. my <laughs> trying to get everyone's attention. Um, no, yes. I thought it was great. So tell. So you had some um, Disney actors, right? Yes. This was such so, such an exciting project. We partnered with Eat, which is End Allergies Together, okay. um, a group that raises money to cure food allergies, as well as several other um, really wonderful uh, foundations, family foundations, and um, nonprofits. To, to film Spell It Out. And what it is, is it's a PSA for children and caregivers um, through about eighth grade, I would say, um, but, but caregivers as well. And it tells the, the, basic, um, you know, the basic facts about food allergies. And we filmed this um, in a low-income school using real children who had real food allergies. And we hired, um, we had, well, they volunteered, but a, a Disney star and a Nickelodeon star with us. And they were wonderful and they were connected to food allergy themselves. So, oh, wow. um, okay. yeah, which was really nice. And they were absolutely lovely with the kids. They were, um, really wonderful. They learned a lot. They came out of that and said, wow, we, I didn't realize all this stuff, um, which was great to hear too, that they had kind of left with a little bit more and really, they were very enthusiastic about the project as were the kids and the, the kids were the best. Um, but what it did was try to dispel some myths about food allergies and really give the facts, um, right. you know, and, and so, and, and this was a- aimed at an underserved population, which doesn't always have access to this kind of education and awareness. So, right. um, it, it, it served its purpose and we're very excited. And in fact, the PSA was just nominated for an Emmy. So we're really, oh, awesome. oh that's going to make me cry. That's yeah. awesome. We're really, Yay. really, really excited and really proud of it. Um, so we, like girl. Said, yeah, thanks. We're so happy. It was so much fun to film, but it was also really eye-opening. I mean, it, did, it, it the principal of the school was there. We were filming, like I said, right at her school, um, and there was a lot. She was knowledgeable about food allergies, um, absolutely, but she still was like, "Oh my gosh, I didn't realize this little bit or that little bit." You know, there's right. just so much to know about um, food allergies that if you don't live with it, you may not know, and even if you do. Uh, if you haven't had the proper amount, you know, proper amount of time right. with your doctor or been able to ask certain questions, you may not realize certain things. So right. um, there's just always something to learn when it comes to food allergies. And, and I can say that 15 years later, when I read about it day in and day out, and I'm sitting in medical right. meetings and, you know, talking to immunologists and yeah, so I, I learn something every single day. Well, and I, there, this has to do with celiac, but um, Alice Best from um, Beyond Celiac, I heard her speak one day. And she had just given a presentation to gastroenterologists about celiac disease and, and basically living with it. And she went to a restaurant at an airport to get some food after the conference on her way home. And she just struggled with 
placing the order and trying to get something, you know, asking the right questions that you have to do as a food allergic person or celiac disease. And the server just didn't understand. And a lady behind her tapped her on the shoulder and she's like, I just sat in your presentation and your interaction that we just had, I just witnessed is mind blowing to me because I didn't know that when I diagnose and say, Hey, you've got celiac, you've got a food allergy, go live your life. This is what you go through. So it opened her eyes. And I think that's a little bit more of what we have to do as well. So it's, unless you, and I say to people, we don't go to the store and buy this allergy or celiac disease or whatever. And we can't go to the store and return it. Like, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, we, it's, it, it's the lot we were handed. And so we live with it and make it work, but it is, it is tough. I mean, there's something that stuck with me that my son said when he was like about eight years old. Uh, I think he said to my grandparents and my parents, his grandparents, and, and they, they, it, it changed their thought about food allergies totally, which is, you know, I can't be careful 50% of the time or 75% of the time. I need to be careful and correct 100% of the time when it comes to food allergies. You know, so whereas um, one person might feel imposed upon for a day, um, you know, I always say, we don't get weekends, we don't get nights, we don't get vacation. This is life. Um, and so all the, the different things that we go through to manage the condition this is what we deal with all the time, no matter where we are, no matter where we go, um, on all, all, all circumstances. And, and it's difficult. And I'm, I've been really encouraged to see that um, in the research world and when it comes to, to dealing with the doctors, more and more um, they are inviting patients to come in and talk about their real world experience with food allergies so that they can give better advice and guidance to others. So I appreciate this podcast for this exact same reason is that you're inviting someone who really lives with this day to day and and manages this in a number of different settings, you know, for adults. I also have um, in-laws, like I said, with food allergies. So I deal with adults with food allergies as well and, uh, and help manage their condition. And, and so I do live with this day to day and it's, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot to, to deal with. Um, and it's not just, when it comes to sitting down at the table, by the way, right. um, this is what a lot of people also don't understand. It comes down to the shampoo that I look at to buy for my, for myself, for my child, the, uh, the chapstick we use, um, the lip balms, the, the lipsticks that I use. If I, God forbid it has sesame oil in it and I kiss him, then he, it will cause a reaction. It's the medicines that he takes. It's the toothpaste that goes into his mouth and the things that they use at the dentist. Um, it can be the laundry detergent. I mean, it's quite right. a lot of things and it's not only limited to the three meals and four snacks you might have a day, which is also a lot. Um, yeah. And that's a really good point. I have a friend who's allergic to garlic and we were supposed to be on a video together and she's like, I've got to postpone because her hands and her face were breaking out because there was garlic in her hair product that she was using. Isn't that crazy? And she didn't know it. And I mean, and then the corn, you know, people with corn allergies, it's in the dryer sheets. It's in the little packaging in the chicken. Everything. It is. As, as allergy strong, um, in addition to spreading education and awareness, we also support families on a case by case basis who have food allergies and are in pretty dire circumstances. And one of these families that we supported, the child had a corn allergy and corn is literally in everything. It's in the, the packets that keep the berries fresh, you know, under I, the cotton yep. that's mm-hmm. got corn in it. Um, I mean, it's, it's hidden under, I don't know, two dozen different names, you know, ascorbic acid that has corn in it, you know, certain it, sugar sometimes has corn in it, like sugar sometimes has corn in it, mm-hmm. not just corn syrup, but you know, right. it was, it was, um, a, a good reminder. It was my son outgrew corn when he was very little. Thank goodness. It was a very good reminder about how difficult life is for people with corn allergies and why they have so many reactions to things. Um, they really, it, it's quite a challenge. All right. So we, you said it a couple of times before, but, um, and we just talked about corn. So what are the top eight allergens? The top eight allergens are dairy, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, fin fish, shellfish, soy, and wheat. Okay. And they are required to be labeled on all products that are in the United States right now by their common names. So they can't be hidden. Like dairy can't be hidden as whey um, or as casein. Uh, it has to be listed as dairy or milk, some kind of common name that can be recognized by anybody. 
Um, any other allergen outside the top eight, however, are not subject to that same rule when it comes to labels. So it makes reading ingredient lists a challenge. You know, as, as I said before, it can be listed under a lot of different, different names like right. sesame seeds, for example, can be listed under general headings like spices or flavors mm-hmm. um, or, a, or a foreign name like tahini or benny seed, something that we don't commonly use here in the United States. So we're looking to change those kinds of things to make it easier for consumers. But right now that's, that's the way the labeling is. Yeah, I know that um, in the EU and Canada, they have, and Australia even, well, like 23 other countries have a longer list of allergens that are required to be labeled on prepackaged foods. And going back to what you said, it has to be labeled in the US on prepackaged foods. There's no requirement on unpackaged foods for those foods to be labeled. That's that's exactly right. So it's important that we're looking at unpackaged foods that you ask a lot of questions if you're a patient. um, And if you are in the service industry, you ask even more questions to make sure that you understand what you're offering to people as they ask you questions. Right. Um, I think that's very important to keep, keep ingredients. I always tell suppliers, please keep the ingredient lists, keep, you know, keep everything handy, have a, have a book. I know mm-hmm. Ming Tsai kind of uh, initiated the, the food Bible. Um, I think that is a worthwhile thing to have in every kitchen, but have supplier lists if you can. And that way, if someone comes to ask you a question about food allergies, it'll make getting that answer all the easier rather than making phone calls kind of on the spot. Um, and the reason why we have these, this top eight list right now in the United States is that those top eight allergens account for 90% of all allergic reactions. So they are common allergies and they account for, you know, commonly they account for the allergic reactions that they see. But any right. food can cause an allergic reaction. And there have been over 170 documented different foods that have caused allergic reactions. So, you know, and, and any of them can cause severe reactions, by the way. So a lot of people are surprised to find out that dairy can cause anaphylaxis um, or that, you know, kiwi can cause anaphylaxis. Yeah, anything really can cause it if you're allergic. So um, that's, another, that's another big misconception that people don't understand. The other thing I'd yeah. like to mention, if you don't mind, is that, yeah. um, I, and I'm about to write about this, so you're catching the preview, but <laughs> I hear a lot of people say that I have a mild allergy to something. And there's a bit of a misconception with that concept. Um, I think it's important for, especially those in the food and service industry, but patients themselves need to understand that there really is no such thing as a mild allergy when it comes to food allergies, that any mm-hmm. food can cause a severe reaction at any time, even if you've had a mild reaction to it before. So as it turns out, Um, you don't have a mild allergy, you've had mild reactions. Um, And your reactions can change time to time. So again, if you've had a hundred mild reactions, the next one still could be anaphylaxis based on how your body interprets the food allergen, the food protein, the amount you've had, whether you've been sick recently or not, whether you've been exercising recently or not. There's a lot of factors that go into the allergic response uh, Mm -hmm. and the reaction that you may have. So it's important to treat every food allergy as a life or death food allergy. And for that goes for patients and those who um, support patients with food allergies. And you just mentioned something about like your environment too. So it's coming up on pollen season and there are a lot of foods that cross react with pollen. So you, if you've got an allergy to pineapple or something like that, the pollen that's out there that's blooming now could actually exasperate your reaction that you had in the past. That's right. And it's really, and so what it comes down to, and not to make anyone more paranoid, right. it just comes down to strictly avoiding asking really good questions. So being prepared and carrying epinephrine with you, be prepared in the event of a reaction. Right. It, it just pays to have that with you. A lot of people find it inconvenient to carry the epinephrine auto injectors. Some of them are very bulky. And of course you always need to have two in right. case one doesn't work or you need a second dose. Um, so you do need to have two with you easily. There's even like leg sheaths you can do. I know men in particular have a hard time carrying epinephrine auto injectors. You know, I know that they don't carry purses that are bags that they're with right. them usually. Um, but find a way to carry it with you and do not leave it in your car. Right. It, it does not do well in heat or in cold. So, um, please do not <laughs> or leave it in away your car. From you. <laughs> right. Exactly. Or away from you. That's exactly right. a really good point. Yeah. If it's not near you, it doesn't help you because every minute really counts if you're having a severe reaction and you just don't know when that next one will be. Right. Um, So again, being prepared really helps and it helps you avoid those reactions in the first place. But having that epinephrine auto injector really is critical. Everyone needs it. Okay, great. So um, getting close to the time that we need to wrap up, do you have a couple of best practices that you can um, 
tell us about um, from the side of a person who has food allergies and then like three of those and then three for the person who's making food for someone? Yes. I have a lot, a lot of tips. Um, <laughs> but when, it com- when it comes to the person who has a food allergy, I mean, I think my best practice is, again, carry your epinephrine. I can't emphasize that enough. That is really the one thing that will save you in the event of a reaction. It's the only medicine we have that stops a reaction. Um, and if you think you're having um, an allergic reaction that involves breathing or any other major sy- symptoms, if you're having two, they say we say two organ systems, which means like if you're getting hives on your skin and you also feel sick to your stomach, those are two organ systems, um, you need epinephrine um, and you do not need Benadryl. So that's number one. And Benadryl is not the only antihistamine that works. Talk to your doctor. Um, <laughs> um, but also just, I say just being prepared really helps. I think having, if you're a, a caregiver, having, you can freeze um, cupcakes. You don't have to make the batch every time. I made that mistake so for so many years. <laughs> freeze the cupcakes and then frost them when you're ready. Um, but being prepared and carrying a little extra, even if it just means you know, having the hamburger bun that's safe for you and bringing that to a restaurant. Those are great little, just little things that are hard to find. Don't let that hamper your experience. Kitchens are usually willing to work with you if you have the, the tools that you need. Um, but as someone who caters to someone with a food allergy, um, I think particularly in the food and beverage space, but I also think schools should be doing this, is I think having an allergy advocate on hand, someone on your staff who understands food allergy um, everyone on your staff should be trained about food allergy, but one person who really gets it, um, who is knowledgeable about what's being served, who is knowledgeable about where the flexibility lies in the kitchen, you know, is it possible to get this dish, but without the sauce, or is it possible right. to get this dish with a different sauce, or is it possible to do X, Y, or Z, um, really understands the flexibility that is available to the kitchen um, would be terrific. It would be such a relief to know that everywhere I went, there was a person I could talk to about food allergies rather than you know, the waiter who doesn't really know, then the manager who doesn't really know. And then finally the chef has a moment to come out 20 minutes after everyone else has ordered or everyone else has already sat down to help me out. Right. So, and I do think it would be very helpful. I I think, think of this in the kind of catering sense more than in the school setting, but uh, you know, imagine if you go to a meeting and you're at a big lunch, which happens all the time at the meetings I go to, and you had one person kind of stand on standby answering the questions, you probably could accumulate a lot of the same questions. A lot of people will come to you with maybe, again, the same allergens. Top eight allergens are the the most common for a reason. Um, And you might be able to answer questions more efficiently rather than answering a hundred different questions about the same 10 things. Um, So I do think it might behoove um, the industry to kind of move in that direction. Food allergies are really, really common. One in every 13 kids have them, but one in every 10 adults have them. So 10% of every gathering you go to, there are people with food allergies and they really believe that number is underdiagnosed because a lot of people just avoid without getting a formal diagnosis. So, um, so it's a significant problem and it might be worth dedicating a resource or a person to that. Thank you so much, Erin Malawar. I did it right. You got it. I know it's a tricky one. (laughs) So Erin Malawar from the Allergy Smallergy um, blog online, CEO of Allergy Health, and executive director of Allergy Strong. Um, thank you. So thank you so much. And actually, before we leave, I want, um, what is your favorite food? Oh, I love so many foods. I, I love international cuisine. So you always catch me. This always catches me on guard. I don't know whether it's to say Cuban or Chinese or Thai <laughs> food. But what I also really love and I crave all the time is I love fried green tomatoes and sugar oh, so grits. Good. Oh my God, I love them so much. <laughs> I went to school in the South and it just stuck with me. I love, I, like everywhere I see them on the menu, I just can't resist. That's awesome. And love where them. can oh, people find you? Like I just I'm like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you can find me on social media mostly at, sorry, at Schmallergy. Can you hear that? Yeah, at Schmallergy yeah. um, on Instagram and Twitter at um, Allergy Strong as well on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and AllergyStrong.com is up and running. Um, so I'd, I'd love to see everybody there. Okay, good. And I will make sure that all of that is in the podcast information Terrific. of how to get a hold of you. And thank you so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, likewise. Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing more of these podcasts. I'm so excited about all your future topics. It sounds so exciting. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrath, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.